Hello there, you perfectly lovely muggles. My name is Sarah and I'm reading from Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone by J.K. Rowling. This is the second part of last night's chapter, chapter 12, The Mirror of Erisid. It's quite a long one. Harry had never in all his life had such a Christmas dinner. A hundred fat roast turkeys, mountains of roast and boiled potatoes, platters of fat chipolatas, terrines of buttered peas, silver boats with thick, rich gravy and cranberry sauce, and stacks of wizard crackers every few feet along the table. These fantastic crackers were nothing like the feeble muggle ones and the Dursleys usually bought, with their little plastic toy and their flimsy paper hats. Harry pulled a wizard cracker with Fred, and it didn't just bang, it went off with a blast like a cannon and engulfed them all in a cloud of blue smoke. While from the inside exploded a rear admiral's hat and several live white mice. Up on the high table, Dumbledore had swapped his pointed wizard hat for a flowered bonnet and was chuckling merrily at a joke Professor Flitwick had just read him. Flaming Christmas puddings followed the turkey. Percy nearly broke his teeth on a silver sickle embedded in his slice. Harry watched Hagrid getting redder and redder in the face as he called for more wine, finally kissing Professor McGonagall on the cheek, who, to Harry's amazement, giggled and blushed, her top hat lopsided. When Harry finally left the table, he was laden down with a stack of things out of the crackers, including a pack of non-explodable luminous balloons a grow-your-own-warts kit and his own new wizard's chest set. The white mice had disappeared and Harry had a nasty feeling that they were going to end up as Mrs Norris's Christmas dinner. Harry and the Weasleys spent a happy afternoon having a furious snowball fight in the grounds. Then, cold, wet and gasping for breath, they returned to the fire in the Gryffindor common room, where Harry broke in his new chest set by losing spectacularly to Ron. He suspected he wouldn't have lost so badly if Percy hadn't tried to help so much. After a tea of turkey sandwiches, crumpets, trifle and Christmas cake, everyone felt too full and sleepy to do much before bed, except for sit and watch Percy chase Fred and George all over Gryffindor Tower because they had stolen his prefect badge. It had been Harry's best Christmas day ever. Yet, something had been nagging at the back of his mind all day. Not until he climbed into bed was he free to think about it, the invisibility cloak and whoever had sent it. Ron, full of turkey and cake and with nothing mysterious to bother him, fell asleep almost as soon as he'd drawn the curtains of his four-poster. Harry leant over the side of his own bed and pulled the cloak out from under it. <clears throat> his father's. This had been his father's. He let the material flow over his hands, smoother than silk, light as air, use it well. The note had said. He had to try it now. He slipped out of bed and wrapped the cloak around himself. Looking down at his legs, he saw only moonlight and shadows. It's a very funny feeling. Use it well. Suddenly, Harry felt wide awake. The whole of Hogwarts was open to him in this cloak. Excitement flooded through him as he stood there in the dark and silence. He could go anywhere in this. Anywhere. And Filch Never know. Ron grunted in his sleep. Should Harry wake him? Something held him back, his father's cloak. He felt that this time, the first time he wanted to use it alone. He crept out of the dormitory, down the stairs, across the common room and climbed through the portrait hole. Who's there? Squawked the fat lady. Harry said nothing. He walked quickly down the corridor. Where should he go? He stopped, his heart racing and thought... And then it came to him, the restricted section of the library. He'd be able to read as long as he liked, as long as it took to find out who Flamel was. He set off, drawing the invisibility cloak tight around him as he walked. The library was pitch black and very eerie. Harry lit a, la a lamp to see his way along the rows of books. The lamp looked as if it was floating along in midair, and even though Harry could feel his arm supporting it, the sight gave him the creeps. The restricted section was right at the back of the library. Stepping carefully over the rope which separated these books from the rest of the library, he held up his lamp to read the titles. They didn't tell him much. 
Their peeling, faded gold letters spelt words and languages that Harry couldn't understand. Some had no title at all. One book had a dark stain in it that looked horribly like blood. The hairs on the back of Harry's neck prickled. Maybe he was imagining it, maybe not, but he thought a faint whispering was coming from the books, as though they knew someone was there who shouldn't be. He had started something. He had to start somewhere. Setting the lamp down carefully on the floor, he looked along the bottom shelf for an interesting looking book. A large black and silver volume caught his eye. He pulled it out with difficulty because it was very heavy and balancing it on his knee, let it fall open. A piercing, blood-curdling shriek split the silence. The book was screaming. <gasps> Harry snapped it shut, but the shriek went on and on. One high, unbroken, ear-splitting note. He stumbled backwards and knocked over his lamp, which went out at once. <gasps> Panicking, he heard footsteps coming down the corridor. Stuffing the shrieking book back on the shelf, he ran for it. He passed Filch almost at the doorway. Filch's pale white eyes looked straight through him and Harry slipped under Filch's outstretched arms and streaked off up the corridor, the book shriek still ringing in his ears. He came to a sudden halt in front of a tall suit of armour. He'd been so busy getting away from the library, he hadn't paid attention to where he was going. Perhaps because it was dark that he didn't recognise where he was at all. There was a suit of armour near the kitchens, he knew that. But he must be five floors above there. You asked me to come directly to you, Professor, if anyone was wandering around at night and somebody has been in the library. Restricted section. Harry felt the blood drain out of his face. Wherever he was, Filch must know a shortcut because his soft, greasy voice was getting nearer and to his horror, it was Snape who replied. The restricted section. Well, they can't be far. We'll catch them. Harry stood rooted to the spot as Filch and Snape came round the corner ahead. They couldn't see him, of course, but it was a narrow corridor and if they came much nearer, they'd knock right into him. The cloak didn't stop him from being solid. He backed away as quietly as he could. A door stood ajar to his left. It was his only hope. He squeezed through it, holding his breath, trying not to move and to, rele and to his relief, he managed to get inside the room without their noticing anything. They walked straight past and Harry leant against the wall, breathing deeply, listening to their footsteps dying away. They had been close, very close. It was a few seconds before he noticed anything about the room that he'd hidden in. It looked like a disused classroom. The dark shapes of desks and chairs were piled against the walls and there was an upturned waste paper basket. But propped against the wall, facing him, was something that didn't look as if it belonged there, something that looked as if someone had just put it there to keep it out of the way. It was a magnificent mirror, as high as the ceiling, with an ornate gold frame, standing on two clawed feet. There was an inscription carved at the top, Erist Stra his panic fading now, that there was no sound of Filch and Snape, Harry moved nearer to the mirror, wanting to look at himself, but see no reflection again. He stepped in front of it. He had to clap his hands to his mouth to stop himself screaming. He whirled around. His heart was pounding far more furiously when the book had screamed, for he had not only seen him, he had not seen only himself in the mirror, but a whole crowd of people standing right behind him. But the room was empty. <gasps> Breathing very fast, he slowly turned back to the mirror. There he was, reflected in it, white, scared looking. And there, reflected behind him, were at least ten others. Harry looked over his shoulder, but still no one was there. Or were they all invisible too? Was he in fact in a room full of invisible people and this mirror's trick was that it reflected them, invisible or not? He looked at the mirror again. A woman standing right behind his reflection was smiling at him and waving. He reached out a hand and felt the air behind him. If she was really there, he'd touch her. The reflections were so close together that he felt only air. She and the others existed only in the mirror. She was a very pretty woman. She had dark red hair and her eyes, her eyes are just like mine, Harry thought, edging a little closer to the glass. Bright green, exactly the same shape, but then he noticed that she was crying. 
smiling but crying at the same time. A tall, thin, black-haired man standing next to her put his arm around her. He wore glasses and his hair was very untidy. It stuck up at the back, just like Harry's did. Harry was so close to the mirror now that his nose was nearly touching that of his reflection. Mum? he whispered. Dad? They just looked at him, smiling, and slowly Harry looked into the faces of all the other people in the mirror and saw other pairs of green eyes just like his, other noses like his, even a little old man who looked as though he and he had Harry's knobbly knees. Harry was looking at his family for the first time in his life. The Potters smiled and waved at Harry and he stared hungrily back at them, his hands pressed flat against the glass as though he was hoping to fall right through and reach them. He had a powerful kind of ache inside him, half joy, half terrible sadness. How long he stood there, he didn't know. The reflections did not fade and he looked and looked until a distant noise brought him back to his senses. He couldn't stay there. He had to find his way back to bed. He tore his eyes away from his mother's face and whispered, I'll come back, and hurried from the room. Oh, oh goodness, what a lovely bit. There's a third part to this chapter. This one's short, so if you want, if you don't want to clean your teeth, wash your hands, and give yourself a great big cuddle, then you can go on to the next one, which is on my website. And you can listen to it next. Here it goes.